let us pray. We give all the glory to Jesus and tell of his love, his wonderful love. We give all the glory to Jesus and tell of his wonderful love. Hallelujah, we give all the glory to Jesus and tell of his love, his wonderful love. We give all the glory to Jesus and tell of his wonderful love. Hallelujah, I give all the glory to Jesus and tell of his love his wonderful love I give all the glory to Jesus and tell of his wonderful love Father we give you all the glory we give you all the honor we give you all the adoration we thank you for your faithfulness. Alpha and Omega, we worship you. We thank you for starting this series on Joshua with us. We thank you that today you are about to close this series. We thank you for your faithfulness, O oh Lord. We thank you for all the lessons we have learned. We thank you for all the changes in our lives that have been brought about as a result of our study. Please accept our thanks in Jesus' name. Father, you always reserve the best in the last. We pray that you give us the best today. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, finally, we've come to part 58. In our series the one for whom the heavens open. Will you please greet one or two people uh, near you and tell them you went well. Mm. And then we may please be seated. Today we want to take just one more look at Joshua chapter 24 from verse 14 to 15. Joshua 24 from verse 14 to 15. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This particular passage has a very great significance for me as an individual. You may not know it, but when I gave my life to Jesus Christ in 1973, and I came to Sunday school for the first time, this Joshua 24 verse 15 was a memory verse that Sunday. Choose who, choose ye whom you want to serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I thank God that God was looking into my future and he arranged for me to start off my journey in Christianity with this passage. The first lesson we learn from this is 
as for me. When it comes to things of God, selfish is not selfishness. You need to take note of that. When it comes to things of God, selfish is not selfishness at all. Because in Matthew chapter 19 verse 19, Matthew 19 verse 19, the Bible says you are to love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 19 verse 19. Meaning what? You must first of all love yourself. And then use that measure of love to love your neighbor. If you don't love yourself, you can't love your neighbor. <laughs> the elders have a saying, they said the one who will gladly step on her dress, we gladly tear the dress of others. As the elders, they will tell you the reason why witches are so terrible is because they can kill their own children. And if somebody can kill her own child, <laughs> and then your child is not safe with her, when it comes to things of God, things deeply spiritual, selfish is not selfishness. The Bible made it clear. In Romans chapter 14 verse 12, Romans 14 verse 12, that everyone will give an account of himself. Who will stand before the judgment throne of God one by one. You will never find two people born the same time, the same way. Even a set of twins must come one before the other. Genesis 25 from verse 19 to 26. Genesis 25, 19 to 26 told us about a set of twins coming out of the same womb. Esau came first. Jacob was in a hurry to come and grabbed his leg. But Esau still came first. <laughs> you have to come to this world one by one. When it is time to go, we will go one by one. When the day of judgment comes, we will stand before God one by one. You say, ah, if God is going to judge all the people of the world and is taking them one at a time, that, won't that take long? Over there, there is no night. There's no type question of saying, oh, uh, we are taking it long. No, 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 we will stand one by one. In Matthew chapter 24, from verse 40 to 41, Matthew 24, 40 to 41, the Bible says two people will be on the same bed when the Lord returns. One will be taken, another will be left. It's a matter of an individual situation. If the husband belongs to God and the wife says, No, I'm not following God. When the rapture comes, no matter how much they say they love each other, they will go one by one. One may go, the other may be left. In Revelation chapter 22, Revelation 22 verse 12, God said 
Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly. I am here to give to every man according to how his work shall be. When it is time to reward you, the reward of the husband will not be given to the wife and vice versa. In Revelation chapter 3 verse 20, Revelation 3 verse 20, Jesus Christ said, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man will hear my voice. Only one fellow. Individually. And then that fellow opens the door to me. Then I come in unto him. Individual salvation. In Revelation chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3, verse 11, the Bible says, Hey, hold fast that which you have. You, as an apostle, an individual, let no man take your crown. You have a crown as a child of God. Hold it fast. He didn't say, don't let anybody take our crowns, your crown. So consider David. It's a very good example. You will find that whenever David is talking about something serious about God, he uses the individual, singular, Psalm 23, verse 1. Oh, if you like, you can read the whole chapter. Psalm 23. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. He didn't say the Lord is our shepherd. He said, I shall not want. He said, when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. I, 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 I. Thou preparest a table before me. Me. Not before us. Oh, there was a time when some people, when they want to finish a service, they will say, let us, uh, after let's say, let us share the grace. And then, uh, and then Psalm 23 verse 6. Uh, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us. I say that's not in the Bible. David didn't say, surely goodness and mercy shall follow us. He says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. Me. It's a matter of individual decision. Salvation is personal. That's why you hear him say in Psalm 34 verse 1, Psalm 34, verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. I, I, I. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. That's David. Let's learn from him. In Psalm 18, from verse 1 to 3. Psalm 18, from verse 1 to 3. He said, I will love thee, my Lord. And then he began to talk about what God is to him. My Lord, my strength. He didn't say our Lord. He didn't say our strength. He said, I know where I'm getting my strength from. He said, my rock. My. Not our rock. He said, my fortress, I know where I go to hide in the time of trouble. (laughs) This boy was talking about something very serious. He knows that the Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and he's safe. And he says, he is my fortress, mine. He says, it's the horn of my salvation. My salvation. My salvation comes from him. He says, it's my high tower. I'm just listening to him. 
the relationship between him and God was so personal that when he made a t- terrible blunder and God sent Nathan to go and tell him, look at what you have done. He said, I am done for. Oh God, I messed up. God said, okay, I won't let you die. We are too close for that. We are too intimate for that. I will punish you, but I won't kill you. You must make up your mind. As for me, I am going to serve the Lord. He is saying, the rest of you can take your own decision. You can choose what you want to do. But my own choice is settled. He said in Psalm 108 verse 1, and I like that. Psalm 108 verse 1. He said, my heart is fixed within me. <laughs> I will bless the Lord. You know the word fixed there? It's like concrete. When you are building a house, you are laying the foundation, and you pour the concrete, they say, wait till it is fixed. Wait till it becomes solid. And once it becomes solid, you, there's nothing you can do about it anymore. It's fixed. When they are building a bridge and they have laid all the iron, etc., 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 they, they, they pour concrete and wait till it is fixed. David said, my heart is fixed. There's nothing you can do that can change my mind. There's nothing that can, that anybody can do to you, if your heart is fixed on Jesus Christ, there's not anything, anything that can happen that will ever cause you to even think of backsliding. But it's an individual decision. Please go over your choice today. Is your heart fixed on serving the Lord? And then he went on to say, as for me and my house. Oh, that's serious. After you have settled the issue of your own salvation, the very next thing you must do is settle the salvation of your household. It's very, very crucial. If there's any member of your family that is not yet saved, you see have a lot of work to do. Look at Rahab. She was a harlot. Read the story. Joshua chapter 2. You can read it from verse 1 to 21. Joshua 2, 1 to 21. Some spies were sent to go and spy Jericho when the children of Israel were about to take over. And since there is no place they can stay in, they stayed in the house of a harlot. The harlot's house is open to anybody. So they stayed there. As soon as they got in, she knew, ah, these are Israelis. They have come. And when the people of the town heard that hey, some strangers have come to the house of the Allot, they came looking. Before they came, she had already hid them. They came to search. Have you seen such and such a people? He said, yeah, they were here, but they've already gone. And so he sent the people away to go and search for the people. And they were still here, hidden with her. After the people who were to pursue them came, she spoke to them. I said, now, uh, you see what I've done for you? 
We have heard about you. We've heard about your God. Your fear is already upon the line. We know you are going to take over this place. Who you please do something for me in return? Spare me and my father's house. Even the harlot knew that her salvation alone is not enough. His household must be saved also. You know the rest of the story. When Jericho finally fell, both herself and every member of her family were spared. Hmm. It's not enough for you to be saved. When you consider the story in Luke chapter 16 from verse 19 to 31, Luke 16, from verse 19 to 31. He tells you the story of a rich man who was always enjoying himself every day. Every day was like Christmas. And there was this uh, Lazarus who was a beggar sitting down by uh, his uh, table at the bottom of the table, picking up crumbs. Dogs would come and lick his wound and so on. And then the rich man died. Lazarus died. And when both of them died, the rich man went to hell. Lazarus went to the bosom of Abraham. The rich man lifted up his eyes and saw Lazarus at the, uh, at the bosom of Abraham and said, Ah, Father Abraham, help me. I'm tormented in this flame. As that young man to come and give me some water to drink. Ask him. I never chased him away when I was in the world. I never attacked him. Let him come and help me now. And, God, and Abraham said, sorry, he can't come. There's a gap between us. What was the next thing that man said? He said, please, I have family members that are still in the world. I don't want them to come to where I am. I'm telling you, brethren, hell is such a place you don't want any member of your family to go to. That man was so desperate, he said, please send somebody from the dead to go and warn my people so that they won't come here. You know the story. And he was denied. If you die and you go to heaven, and you look down from the threshold of heaven and you see members of your family in hell, and God forbid, that's going to create a problem for you. You must wake up today to a very, very urgent assignment, the salvation of your family. When you read Acts chapter 16, from verse 25 to 34, Acts 16, 25 to 34, when the jailer, you know the story, Paul and Silas were in jail, and the jailer was there, watching over them to make sure they won't escape. The moment the jailer saw the power of God and he gave his life to Jesus Christ, the next thing he did was to gather his family together so that all of them can see salvation at the same time. The jailer, did, the jailer didn't wait till the second day let me tell you one thing. Prison is not a place for soft people, particularly in those days. Soft-hearted people cannot be a jailer. Jailers in those days are tough people, people with hearts of stone. 
But when this man found salvation, the first thing he thought about was his family. And many of you listening to me now, only God knows how long ago you have been born again. Only God knows how many members of your family are still far from God. You know fully well that if any man dies without Christ, he's going to hell. You know it. You are thanking God that you have escaped hell because you have received Jesus Christ. What about members of your family? Wake up today. I know some, several of us have already won souls to Christ. And you are still winning souls to Christ in your place of work, on your way to work, etc., etc. What about your own people? Charity should begin at home. <laughs> in Acts of the Apostles chapter 10, you read it from verse 1 to the end. Acts of the Apostles chapter 10, 1 to the end. All the good works of Cornelius was rewarded by salvation for himself. And when God sent an angel to him to say, send for somebody who will show you the way of salvation, he did not wait for Peter alone. As soon as he knew Peter was coming, he gathered together every member of his family. Your family must be saved. If you are saved and you ignore the salvation of just one of your children, that can destroy every promise of God for your life. You know the story, 1 Samuel chapter 2, read it from verse 12 to 36. 1 Samuel 2, 12 to 36. Eli was a high priest of God. God said to him, I said to you, I said, indeed, that you and your father's house will stand before me forever. But now I say, God forbid. Why? Because his children were not following in his footsteps. You can't afford for any member of your household not to be saved. Because just one person in your household that is not saved can destroy the future of the household. <clears throat> it takes only one sinner to destroy the destiny of a complete, an entire family. Just one sinner. When you read Second Kings chapter 5 from verse 20 to 27, 2 Kings 5, 20 to 27, it was Gehazi alone that sinned. But when God was pronouncing a judgment on him, he said the leprosy of Naaman will cleave on him and unto his seed forever. Forever. He became the patron saint of lepers. Medicine is just discovering what has been there all along, that there are certain diseases that are genetical. If there is a curse in the genes of your parents, it will affect you. That's why the Bible says if you are in Christ, you become a new creature. You have to be created anew so that the genes of those people <laughs> coming before you might not have a negative uh, effect on you. That's why he says you become a new creature, that all things are passed away, all things become new. It's not you alone that must be saved. 
your family also must be saved. And so, I'm crying to you, those of you who are listening to me, those of you who are already born again, go now and begin serious work on every member of your family so that you'll be able to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for those of you who have not given your life to Jesus, I appeal to you. You may become the first one in your family to be saved, and then you can, through your own effort, bring your entire family to God. So if you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, please bow your head now in prayer. Cry unto him to save your soul, to forgive you, and promise him you will serve him for the rest of your life. Call on him now, and I will pray for you. My Father, my God, once again I want to say thank you for your word. And I want to thank you for all those who have made up their mind that now they want to surrender their life to you. Father, please receive them. Save their souls. Let your blood wash away every sin in their lives. Receive them into the family of God. And just let it be well with them. And for those of us, Lord God Almighty, who are born again and there are members of our families here to be born again, please have mercy on us. Give us the grace from now on to rigorously pursue the salvation of every member of our family so that our joy may be full. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I rejoice with those of you who have given your life to Jesus Christ. I want to promise you from now, by the grace of God, I'll be praying for you. But please go to the nearest redeemed Christian Church of God to you. Tell the pastor I sent you, and he will tell you what to do next. Very soon, I'll be hearing good news concerning you in Jesus' mighty name. Praise the Lord.